Hello everyone, thank you for joining Carla 2020 and welcome to today's conversation between Ilva Havel and myself entitled Reflections, Race, Film in Europe. My name is Temba Bebe, I'm a film industry programmer with several specialities, one of which is of course diversity inclusion, um, in particular at the European film market where I've been in charge of the market's diversity and inclusion initiative for the past three years. Ilva, over to you. Uh, my name is Ilva Habel. I'm originally a cinema studies scholar and nowadays a senior lecturer in media and communication studies. And for the moment, I have been involved in the Swedish Film Institute's report on anti-discrimination regarding women, white women, women of color and black women. Uh, what is very particular about CALA 2020 is that the conference brings together researchers such as myself, as well as activists and film industry professionals. Thank you very much, Rifti, for bringing together, um, as I ever said, these three categories of individuals. And of course, most of all, thank you, Rifti, for bringing it together. So in today's discussion, Ilva and I are going to reflect on the ways in which race intersects with film and civil society in Europe from our perspective as Black Europeans working in film. And the conversation will, of course, take into account some of the shifts and upheavals that we have seen this year. First of all, with the COVID-19 pandemic and then the global uprisings against anti-Black races in the wake of George Floyd's murder. So we do have a note on housekeeping, uh, housekeeping of a very particular nature. Um, before we make a start, we have a reminder about the ethos of Color 2020. We have a pledge that we're upholding that all um, the participants have to sign and commit to when they register with the conference. The pledge lays down some ground rules of anti-discrimination, mutual respect and cultural safety. So I'll read, our speakers do not and will not condone any forms of discrimination by themselves or perpetrated by others on the basis of ethnicity, religion, geographical origin, skin color, religious beliefs, sexuality, gender identity, socioeconomic class, disability or age. Our speakers declare that they do not and will not tolerate sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, ableism, fascism and other isms. It is quite a long list but we wanted to really underline the fact that whatever those forms of discrimination are, these isms really do have no place at Color 2020. Um, so to get us started, we've seen quite a year this year with a global pandemic which has laid bare all of the structural inequalities in terms of race, gender, socio-economic class, in many places, black and brown people have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic due to pre-existing conditions and entrenched inequities of their social conditions. And of course, that pandemic has been um, very much followed by, you know, the global uprising against racism and beyond the Black Lives Matter movements. We've seen um, a general kind of reawakening and reckoning with racism, both past and present, which has really um, shone a light on police violence world worldwide. Um, and also on structural racism in terms of housing, on employment, education, government policies, but also in our film industry, of course. And then in terms of history, it's really been a time of revisiting and revisioning racism in the past, um, in particular by challenging the, the names and the statues of all of those so-called heroic figures of the colonial era who populate those spaces, who populate our public spaces. And most of all, it's been in many ways kind of a, a reminder of the damage past and present um, and how that kind of that past violence articulates with the violence of, of today. Most of all, and I like the, the analogy or the metaphor which was used in a panel during Cannes by Amelia Roy, who's the president of the Center for Intersectional Justice, and who will also be talking about Carla 2020, she used the metaphor of the matrix glasses. And it's very much this idea of the matrix glasses have been taken off to show the dystopian reality of racial oppression. And that was really a visualizing two sequence. The first sequence of Amy Cooper and the second part of that sequence, which was really George Floyd. We had this, the impression of staring you in the eye with its steely gaze. I very much agree that there is a steely gaze of white supremacy that comes upon us during these times of COVID-19 because what has been sort of a, an invisibilized power structure now becomes very clear in your face. What we have seen is that the funding structures and the sort of emergency monetary funding structures have been sort of hijacked by whiteness and by larger corporations. When COVID-19 hit us this spring, both artists, cultural workers, cultural museums and 
institutions could apply for emergency funding. But in order to be able to apply, you had to estimate the loss you have made recently or the estimate you think that you would lose during a certain time. And for many independent cultural workers and artists, it's not possible to estimate how much you're going to lose. And then you were not eligible for applying. So there were protests against these things and open letters. And afterwards, as spring drew on, uh, we could see that uh, those who landed the largest pots of money were institutions such as the ABBA Museum and other larger actors, established artists with administrations behind them that could make these applications quickly. So we very quickly saw a list of those larger corporations, companies, establishments that could receive funding while artists and independent cultural workers still have to see uh, some kind of um, money coming their way and it's been almost half a year. When talking about white governmentality, what has been seen before and which is now reinvigorated by the racism that has been critiqued during COVID-19 and the anti-black uh, racism up uprisings across the globe is that white people decide to rather than speak to us and to speak to black organizations and other art organizations of color that are already established and already have lots and lots of mileage of intellectual contributions, criticism, anti-racist initiatives. We already have those in place. And instead, white majorities, both in Sweden and elsewhere, replace these perennial forms of knowledge with newfound awakenings. Like, we need to begin to, to work against racism now. We need this initiative and we need to start funding this and that. So I think in England, there has been a critique against these initiatives because those initiatives that are supposed to promote and mobilize research and, and activities against anti-black racism, for instance, does not benefit the black community at all, but instead gives money and employment to white people or other people of color. So with every new mainstream initiative, we see this dynamic repeat itself over and over and over again. And similar observations have been made, I think, for many countries. I really just couldn't agree more. I mean, to go back to this, what you're saying, we've seen that very much reflected in all of the statements, pledges, you say, which have been penned over the past uh, three or four months. And it, it really under, it kind of underlines and highlights and underscores the way in which PWI, so predominantly white institutions, and the way in which they behave and this kind of constant reawakening that we have just realised. And we'll come back to this point of the, of the, of the we and who, who is speaking um, during the we um, in that kind of locus of enunciation, let's say. So yeah, that's what's really we've seen with this kind of over the past four months. It's been this idea of this kind of rendering visible of what we can really call institutional whiteness. So, you know, as you say, in the film world, world we've seen a proliferation of all, all, of, all of these statements of, of solidarity and prejudice and promises. And yet, you know, as, as we know, during the pandemic, many of these institutions, cultural institutions, filmic institutions were silent, particularly on the effects of that pandemic on black and indigenous people and other people of color um, across the world. And we also saw that many workers who were working on diversity and inclusion were furloughed or laid off, or many workers who were involved in initiatives, you know, affect which work with marginalised groups were also laid off. And that was mainly because of this, um, you know, mainly in part due to this, bi this, this binary, you know, essential workers, non-essential workers, which arose during this time um, where people like ourselves and other um, people within the cultural industries were seen as being almost disposable and, and, and it wasn't really high up on the agenda. I'd be interested to know how you've seen that play out in Sweden uh, in particular. As yet, I don't think that I can summarise 
any hard facts around this but uh, see the tendencies. As I said before, independent cultural workers, actors and others uh, who cannot estimate the losses they will make have so far been without money. And what, what you say about, uh, and what I said earlier about reinventing anti-racist initiatives, that's what we're living through at the moment. We are seeing the results of reports on anti-black racism repeated. Mm. And I'm myself involved in another report, another part of that report, which is about qualitative interviews around black people and their experience of discrimination on the job market. But what comes out there is that the difference between just salaries, because the, the refusal to acknowledge racism in Sweden has led to the invisibilization of suppression against black communities. So we, the we that counts, do not keep track since we don't talk about race and racism. We can talk about racism, but we should not mention race is often the the sort of understood imperative. But anyway, it was found out that the difference in wages could be as big as uh, black people only getting about 63% of a white person's wage in the equivalent position and profession, counting in uh, factors such as experience, education. So uh, black people basically need to have almost a PhD in order to get the same kinds of job that white people and other minorities can get with less education. So that is a difficult fix. And since we're constantly awakening to this problem, we are also stuck with the imperative to discuss and debate. And we will come back to debating logics later, I think, as well. But the imagination is, or the collective imposed imagination is that we should talk more about racism. And this talking mode keeps us passive, uh, keeps us trapped into discussing because Another imposed, not really spoken logic, but assumed logic, is that we should all agree on what racism looks like. So it becomes also a discussion around what terms we can use. And there's gigantic resistance against using the word racism. Mm. So it's very difficult to get anywhere in these discussions. And maybe the brutality of what we've seen this year the omnipresence of anti-black racism in violent forms everywhere that gets exposed in the wake of uh, the murder on black people. Of course, that helps. White majorities surely see the urgency, but also what I've seen in the past is that this urgency sort of fades and then we're back to normal. Uh, We are unable, or the we that counts, are unable to see uh, what anti-black racism is actually about. And they also unlearn what they knew. So what we think we know about uh, anti-black racism is something that is constantly unlearned again. And it's so interesting what you say because that echoes with so much with what's going on and so much which has taken place in the past. I think you know that there's been a pledge which has been launched uh, by a collective of cultural workers who are people of colour called the Arts in Colour Pledge and it's very much this idea of, you know, uh, business as usual, right? It, that we can't go back to business as usual. We can't go back to this mm-hmm. idea that um, people aren't aware of what's taking place in terms of the marginalisation of cultural workers and particularly those within the film industry. And you also talk about the fact that you know the expectation that we have to deal with these issues and that it's a reminder of of a quote I think by Toni Morrison and I don't have the exact quote in mind but it's something to do with the distraction right that we have to deal with the distraction of having to deal with fundamentally what is work which is you know that aims at including our humanity in the full spectrum um, of work and of course civil society Yeah, Toni Morrison writes, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. 
someone says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. What we see also is that the debate around Black Lives Matter has very much been picked up by others as an uh, opportunity to lift their own experiences of racism. So black people are already getting marginalized by other groups of color. And that is also a dynamic that we have seen in, in other countries. And I think that we must be in the North, uh, some of the last people to sort of show this same kind of dynamic. And it's very tiring, I must say. Exactly. I mean, I think during this movement, there has been the wider, obviously, Black Lives Matter movement and its um, it all championing of the struggle against anti-Black racism within white mainstream societies, majority societies, right? But we've also, as not even a footnote, but as part of that movement, that, that has brought about a, an, also an examination of anti-Black racism within other non-Black PLCs, which is particularly necessary, especially if part of the, you know, the general movement in, in challenging and dismantling white supremacy must involve all of its effects, and one of those is anti-Black racism. I wanted to piggyback off what you were saying about the fact that this is a moment, and you're not sure if, in a particular Swedish context, if you're really seeing a shift in awareness in, in anti-Black racism, in racism more generally, and in the effects of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, I think what's interesting about this period is that we've seen very much like the coexistence of two kind of counter challenging discourses around both the pandemic but around also what's taking place in terms of the global uprising. We saw, as we said, this prolifer proliferation of pledges and statements and we want to help you and we want to do more to fight anti-black racism, we want to do more to fight racism more generally, we want, we want to include you, we have to provide more resources and so on and so forth by many cultural and film institutions, but we also saw counter discourses come into play. So we saw some of the cultural workers who had worked for these institutions um, actually called them out for hypocrisy and double standards because those very same cultural workers had actually faced marginalization. Some of them had um, called out the way in which those institutions treat films by black indigenous people of color. They um, they kind of challenged the general status quo of the institutional races, but, institutional whiteness and racism of those mm -hmm. institutions and they had faced retaliation, they'd been marginalized, they'd been placed into a box, they'd been fired and so I, I think this is the important shift. The, the counter discourses because we're in a 2.1 era are the digital era, they are there and they are present and they have very much kind of in, in some way dismantled um, those official discourses if not at least challenged them. I think that's been one of the kind of the salient parts of um, aspects of what we're seeing now. We've seen open letters um, particularly by you know, know, collectives of workers who are people of colour who have very much stated that there are these diversity policies, there are all these initiatives, but essentially the situation has changed. Essentially, films, they're still facing the same um, hurdles to have their films financed, to find producers, to you know overcome gatekeepers. And I know these are buzzwords, but it's really true the fact that these gatekeepers have biases and they don't see the potential in some of these films because they don't see the audiences for the films or they're not they don't share the perspectives. And so, um, you know, these are all hurdles which have been highlighted in, in all of these letters. Um, and then most of all, you know, we've seen, I mean, you're a researcher and we've seen research appear during this time. And I, you know, springs to mind most of all the research by Gemma Desai, who's a British cultural worker and who's worked in several front-running British culture and film institutions and who's created and crafted a wonderful body of research which takes into account her perspectives, her experiences of other cultural workers who are people of colour, in particularly black workers in the UK. Mm -hmm. She really specifically also deals, as you say, with this question of anti-blackness and the way in which non-black PLCs can contribute to anti-blackness within those institutions. Yeah. She, she takes that on. Uh, fully and what she shows is very much a dichotomy between the positive diversity talk of cultural institutions and the positive statistics on the one hand and on the other hand the marginalization of certain black and other people of color within these within these institutions in the UK and the way in which they center whiteness in the way in which the audiences are conceived in the way in which the films are treated and so I think you know this this idea of the dichotomy between 
the, the self on the one hand and the versus the outward image is also something that takes place in Sweden. So I wanted to ask you how that plays out in Sweden. The, there has also been uh, similar pro protests in Sweden and, and open letters against uh, what you could call white governmentality. And we, we see similar dynamics where uh, there is sort of happy diversity talk yeah. and pledges while everything is managed in the everyday through what we can call white governmentality. That necessitates white leadership, white initiatives, white ideas, and, and very Eurocentric cultural frames. So what you're talking about, not seeing the value of other types of narratives, is something that I think is the most usual problems of, of both Europe and, and the rest of the West, that white majorities simply cannot fathom, with a few exceptions, of course, that narratives can, can be done otherwise, that we don't need to adhere to already established narrative structures. What, what I see again and again is that both European and more Western norms about what signifies as an interesting narrative mm -hmm. is very set and, and rigid. And that uh, white majorities, when getting proposals, probably cannot. I, I don't have insight into these process. I can only make a qualified guess. Mm -hmm. But I, I think since we don't see these other narratives, they must be stuck and barred from from entering because there is such a uniformity of narrative standards mm. that need to be loosened up and they can only be loosened up by getting more black and other people of color into power into positions that matter we cannot only be uh, situated at the bottom of the hierarchy, waiting for funding, waiting for acknowledgement, waiting for a seat at the table. That is very, very tiring. So this is an image oh. of an article. <laughs> yes, it does inspire laughter from mid-June, an article in Euronews, which, as you can see, depicts, as it's written, a task force of, of sorts, which was launched at the European Union to, you know, with her team of EU commissioners, Ursula von der Leyen, in June, wanted to launch a debate on racism. So the we, Eva, what springs to mind? When you... I, I think it's a horrid image, and it really shows the fix we're in. For one, I mean, the most obvious thing, no people of color and no black people in particular are there and that has already been critiqued and, and commented upon for years and years that there are no positions almost no positions of power that black people occupy the other problem that is also obvious is that they are to hold a debate on race i mean if we were to address questions of human rights civil rights is that something we would debate? I don't think so, mm -hmm. because it's pretty obvious that everyone should have human rights. But every time the question is around racism, white people decide that it's going to be a debate. And I have refused to participate in debates on races at least the last 10 years, six times, because I think that compromised way of addressing racism, if black and other people of color still need to convince white people of the very basic thing that racism exists and the forms in which it exists. It is a corrupted debate. We don't need to debate that. We need to just face it. The white uh, majoritarian we already have the required knowledge. Mm -hmm. They have all the reports, they have all the statistics, except from that type of statistics that they can't get because they refuse to acknowledge race in racism and therefore refuse to count us so that we can count. I mean, that is also part of the blatant dishonesty and double standards that we're trapped in. 
by white majorities. We cannot address racism as long as we have these conditions of possibility, or maybe I should say conditions of impossibility. Mm. Very much so. So this next slide is Jack Parrick is a journalist. According to everything what you said, he really called out everything that you said, this institutional whiteness, the fact that there's already knowledge there. And, you know, when you're having a conversation like this, you should at least try to include European people of color and black people within that conversation, or at least look like you're trying to include them. And again, you know, the way in which this was answered, we will have a structured debate on racism. We, as if racism needs to be proved yet again within European society, when there's so much research there's so much embodied experience of racism and the effects of racism are very are clear for all you know for everyone to see also this idea of futurity that the fact that this debate will take place to, in order for racism to be solved at a future time which is something that we'll come back to but i wanted to again just to kind of finish off on this uh, this idea of the we which is kind of on this undifferentiated we which is kind of really underlined here you know, it's the idea that we saw within these pledges and these, these statements, you know, these, these sentences like, we need to do more, we need to bring more of you people of colour into the fold. For you and I, it's more of a question of, no, you need to look like Stockholm, London, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Barcelona, Marseille, etc. You need to look like all of these places, including rural areas where black and, and other people of colour live. You need to imagine yourself differently, your audiences differently, your communication differently, and your decision making differently. It's as simple as it's very deleterious in a way um, when it's not made explicit. And to move on to the very last one with this idea of the we, two excerpts from pledges which were made recently, they are, if you Google them, you cannot find which pledge they're from, so they're anonymized. Mm -hmm. Especially if you look at the last one, there's an attempt at self-criticism. But I think, again, the problem is that if an institution which is predominantly white makes that attempt at criticism they have to also name and indicate what the problem is and if you do not indicate that you're a predominantly white institution if you do not indicate that it is structural racism if you do not indicate that it's institutional whiteness then you're also serving the purpose of institutional whiteness which is to render itself invisible and unseen and uh, you see this repeated constantly and there are several problems involved here as you said, the we that is never examined or, or acknowledged as such, as the given but unacknowledged center of every discussion and initiative and power structure. And the other thing is the logic of inclusion. I, I remember James Baldwin saying that it's not, we shouldn't want to be integrated into a burning house. And that is what. Uh, normal is a burning house for for black people according to my view uh, we should not strive to be only included into an already corrupt structure mm -hmm. that uh, departs from white supremacy we need to reconstitute everything and of course i'm not the first person to say that so we need to imagine differently, as you said, and not take for granted or accept that white supremacy uh, must stand as it is mm. with a few minor adjustments to chisel off a bit here and make it softer around there to fit everyone because it wouldn't and it can't and it shouldn't. Mm. So what white institutions if we're talking about the cultural sector and the film industry, must realize is that they cannot leave a minimal space in which they engage in diversity on their terms that they choose, which can basically be minor adjustments, a few launches, a little funding here, a temporary initiative there they need to open up material spaces and make not only changes but to reconstitute the premise of of how we can speak about culture how we can speak about cultural production how we can speak about agency creativity and this optimistic diversity speed simply must go I'm being straightforward here, but I think it's necessary because I'm also tired. <laughs>
We're here, I mean, we're here for hard talk, of course. Um, <laughs> we're here for hard talk. Um, and I like yeah. what you say about, you know, I, I, I'm inspired what you say about, not inspired, but I think it's very perceptive what you say about uh, the idea of engaging, the fact that we're quite often forced to engage with diverse inclusion with marginalized groups on the terms of the dominant white institutions. Um, and I think one of the more visible ways in which that happens, especially in terms, you know, in the context of film and in the context of film screenings, is the way in which films are presented to their audiences and the way in which those audiences are conceived by these institutions. And quite often there is a, the idea that the audiences are, are centered in the centering of the whiteness of those audiences, that they're, they're not imagined that people of color can also be, you know, black and indigenous people and, and other people of color can also be included in those audiences by these institutions. And so the way in which they communicate around those film screenings, but also the communication within those screenings, and in particular within the idea of moderation, it's often quite blatant. I've been in so many films film screenings in Europe where the films centre around marginalised groups, they might even centre around black people, they might even centre around black queer people, but that, that moderation has been framed as this film is a gift, this film is exotic, thank you for bringing this film to us, whereas this film is my reality and I feel completely alienated by that moderation which um, views the people and views vectives uh, vehicled in those films as being as being external to the experience of the audience and so the questioning the questions which are thrown out to the audience or the way in which the filmmaker is made to talk about the film is a completely um, detached almost out of body experience for me quite often I think this is something that you've also experienced with um, black films in Sweden um, and the way in which they've been sometimes presented by Swedish um, institutions Yes, black film generally, I can't speak for the most recent years because I haven't been to film festival organization, Cinemafrica, mm. which has a different take. In the 90s and 2000s, there was still a lot of white dominance in Cinemafrica and also white governmentality, but that has changed. So Cinemafrica is now led by, by black people mostly. And also Cinema Africa now addresses not only African film, but diasporic film. Mm -hmm. But before that, there was this tendency whenever you would see uh, films with black or African people that it was given sort of a whitish framework, even though uh, guest speakers and black directors and African directors were invited, we still would have a white framework. And what we see also is that the conditions of possibility for talking about diversity is so conditioned by this white gaze. Mm. Not only do we need to have the debating and the sort of neoliberal doubt structure uh, imposed on us, but we also need to be enveloped in over-optimism, we need happy narratives of diversity and we need solution-focused discussions, what, what we're meant to be in the future. And so it's impossible or very difficult at least to address the racism that we are in because uh, what we see, I think both in, in Swedish contexts and in other is that majoritarian mindsets are so exceedingly vulnerable to critique or makes it vulnerable to critique so mm -hmm. that we cannot stay put in the problem and discuss it in detail or rather to, to just observe and note the details of it but must rush ahead to the dream of solving racism, of ending racism, because white mindsets also find it difficult to, to have a stamina when it comes, comes to discussing racism. It cannot stay in the problem, but must rush forward to an imagined solving of the problem. And that in itself is a problem uh, because white people do not want to feel unhappy about racism because then they feel guilty. And as much as I think that 
guilt is unproductive, responsibility at least must be acknowledged. They must face responsibility for years and years and years and years ahead. I think that in this kind of pre-inscribed optimism of diversity speak, there's also a language of anticipation, as Catherine McKittrick argues. Mm. We have to continue waiting for our humanity. We, as she says, in an imaginary waiting room. And as we've spoken about before, when we've discussed this, that there is a tricky thing that white supremacy does with temporality as well, that we are in the sphere of hope and looking to the future, the bright future, when racism is over overcome, which also lets white supremacy off the hook. It doesn't have to stay in the problematic now, mm. but are somewhere over there. And that is something I think we also need to address. Definitely. I mean, this idea of the self-realizing prophecy of the future racial democracy or the future racial equity, not just in Europe, but across the world, it's always something which will be solved tomorrow, the, temp the, the futurity of that uh, temporality. We, won't, we can make the steps, we can make the moves. Let's start now with small steps and then... Um, later on, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll include you. It's a constant evacuating or postponing that to the future, which I think links to a larger problem of articulating racism now and of articulating race full stop um, in Europe, which affects us especially. And I think before we even talk about articulating race, there's a problem in the terminology um, which is used, especially at institutional level in Europe. If you look at the very term diversity, which in itself for me is quite a problem, it, has, it almost becomes quite a problematic term because it doesn't include the idea of agency, it's purely descriptive. If you look at that term, even if you set aside that um, consideration, diversity in Europe often stands for nation state diversity or cultural diversity. And so it's, you know, it stands for we are a diverse European Union because we have people from France and from Germany, from Sweden and, and so forth. But within that nation statehood, all of the regional identities, certainly, um, but also the people like us who don't necessarily only found our identity in region, in, in nation statehood, but also uh, found our identity in diasporas and also marginalized within those nation states we become completely invisible. And so we're completely invisible in terms of policymaking at European level. And even the idea of race itself has been rendered in many contexts invisible. In France, the word race has been removed from the constitution because biological race doesn't exist as we know, but race is a socio-cultural construct which leads to a differential treatment of black and people of colour um, does exist, and I don't mean to be didactic, but it is important to restate that quite often because that very fact is, is lost. Um, and here in Germany, recently the Green Party is also advocating for the same measure to be adopted in Germany for the word Rasa, race, to be removed from the German constitution exactly for the same reasons. And so there's this invisibilization of the concept of race, but also a general difficulty to articulate race in uh, within the European context. I've seen a tweet that I, I use all the time nowadays. Someone on Twitter, whose name I can't remember, who, who said in response to white people in your cringing when, when they hear the word race, mm -hmm. uh, you invented race, you deal. Exactly. Basically that. So you cannot first invent this and order the entire world according to a racial scheme and then just turn your back on it. No, <laughs> now it doesn't exist anymore. So all the consequences of imperial and colonial races, we will not deal with them. So we will erase them from, from our languages. Mm. I mean... I don't know if white majorities and, and white governments think that this looks like an intelligent thing to do, but no, to the rest of us, uh, I think this does not look like a good idea. Exactly. And when we were talking the other day, you said that part of the reason lays uh, in the past in which during the colonial period, the, the colonization, the slavery, the situation, the situation 
that was always was always cast and viewed as something which is remote, as something which is far away. So in many ways, there wasn't a, a dealing with, a grappling with, a handing, a processing of all of these things which were taking place at that time, which has very much been, which very much feeds into the situation now. The historical consequences of colonialism and imperialism is something that is still unfolding in the present. As Christina Sharp argues, we're in the wake of chattel slavery. Uh, black people around the world, both the diaspora and people on the African continent, are still dealing with the consequences of imperialism, colonialism, and chattel slavery. It is not, as Sadia Hartman said, an overlong memory that we suffer from. These are material consequences that we have to deal with. And I can't believe the, the amount of bad faith still invested in finding explanations to the oppression of black people elsewhere. Mm. The ways in which we are supposedly uh, undeserving of civic and human rights for every reason they can come up with. No. These are the consequences of colonialism. These are the consequences of the classificatory system of races that Europe invented and used against us and a system which they used to deal out privileges or bereavements and to constitute serving classes from the Asian diaspora for example, to manage us. Those structures are still in place in parts of the African continent. The term bad faith really crystallizes um, the, some of the reactions, some of the, po not even pockets of resistance, but some of the large scale resistance that we've seen in, in Europe to the global uprisings and to the way in which it's been, the discourses that we've seen, the public discourses that we've seen in the press in particular, whereby um, it's been, you know, the Black Lives Matter conversation um, movement despite the fact that there are many cases of police violence, um, many cases of deaths in custody across Europe um, of black people, of other people of colour, it's been viewed as many, you know, by many as an importation and many mm. concepts have also been viewed as an importation. I've seen so many articles which defend um, the, context of, you know, the concepts of white supremacy, of white privilege and so on and so forth um, because they are US, US North American concepts which don't um, really have a, uh, an application to Europe. And I would argue against that fact that they are just because the US had to find language um, in order to name uh, these concepts yes. that, that, as, you know, that people like yourselves have been using those concepts for, for, for decades already within the European context. The social structures and the, the brutality of anti-black structures that existed and still exist in the U.S. necessitated them to have a vocabulary for dealing with it. Of course, that has also been refused in many ways and backpedaled, but they need to live with that and need to address that. In Europe, since we are refusing to deal with the race word in racism and the racialization of black and brown people, we are backpedaling in a manner that gradually contributes to degrading black people more and more. So we're coming more and more similar to the structures and what is happening in the US. So the, the normalization of police brutality, for instance, which I would call police practice, because it's mm -hmm. not individual policemen that are brutal, but rather a state-sanctioned system that enables them to wage this power over black and brown bodies. Mm. So yeah. that system gets more and more normalized and it is inspired by the US and Israel. And when, since that is where people go to, to get educated about uh, more effective, so to speak, police practices. So, and when we protest that, they say that we import a non-existent problem in Europe that is US-based to us. 
So, I mean, the argumentatory logics of that, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really something. It, it is outrageous. It is, absolutely. And I saw you making a circular movement because it is a vicious circle in, in so many ways. It's, uh, you know, this idea of bad faith, but also um, denialism of the racialization which takes place in Europe currently, um, which links to um, the disavowal of, you know, the fact that Europe is the cradle of racialization. Race was created in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries by, you know, the architects of all of those theories of racialization, the architects of the theories of the hierarchies of the races, the architects of the theories around white supremacy. These all took their root in Europe and were um, exported across the, you know, across the four corners of the earth. So what we're seeing now is not necessarily re a, even a reimportation. It's just the the, net, the logical consequence of theories being exported across across the world, and that started with the church, obviously. That started with philosophers. That started with the courts of Europe, who all uh, dissemin disseminated that, you know, they created white supremacy. And I think it's important to also name some of the names, and I'll come back to you to name one of the particular. Mm -hmm. ones. You know, if we, it's let's say their names. So you know, people like Arthur de Gobineau, who wrote an essay on the inequality of human races, Karl Hagenbeck. Um, who was a scientist, but who also had, you know, human zoos. Um, there's actually a Hagenbeck uh, animal zoo, which exists in, in Hamburg. He had human zoos with people from Africa, but also the Sami people, people from um, Tierra del Fuego in Chile. After Schopenhauer, uh, Schopenhauer also spoke about around, you know, white supremacy. Charles White wrote uh, an essay called The Great Chain of Being. Um, and I think in Sweden you had um, Carl Linnaeus. Uh, who classified uh, the system of plants and also animals. And I think what is most influential in his work is his classification of humans into the categories that read like Homo sapiens europaeus, Homo sapiens asiaticus, Homo sapiens americanus, Homo sapiens afer, or Homo sapiens africanus. Mm -hmm. And he also added, since his period also signifies the continuum between aspiring science and fantasy and magic. So he also formulated two more magic human categories who were Homo sapiens ferus, wild people, and Homo sapiens monstrosus. And his categories have later been used and stabilized or, or calcified in our system of classifying uh, human beings in the world. And we still live with those classificatory systems that have been, of course, changes and adapted to local, local and regional discourses. Mm. But we, we still live with those classifications today implicitly. And uh, I think that that is a real problem. Recently, during spring, there were calls for taking his statue down. There is a statue in, a, in a, one of the central uh, parks in Stockholm. But uh, it never got any support because Linnaeus has contributed so greatly. He's, he's sort of the beacon of science to so many. So that, that was seen as an impossibility. And also what was argued was that this was an attempt to erase history as if we don't learn history from books, but from monuments in the city. I don't know if you had similar discussions. Um, yeah, I mean, as you know, I lived in France for 16 years and I'm still very connected to that country and I have a French passport. I followed all of the similar discussions which were taking place in France and they particularly focused around uh, Colbert. Um, so there are several statues of Colbert, um, who was a French minister who actually wrote the Code Noir, which was the Black Code, which created a legalized framework for slavery, basically. And so it, he's seen as also being as one of the architects of racialization, especially in the French context. Or as you may know, in, in France is one of these places where there is a very high level of resistance, which is also due to, um, let's say, the kind of exceptionism which you talked about in Sweden. So France obviously has a heroic past of, of the revolution and of lots of political emancipatory struggles, but also, on the other hand, in the underbelly, 
this huge dynastic colonial past, which it hasn't, in my view, necessarily digested. And so it also has this dichotomy between the way it sees itself and that past and the way in which it deals with that past today in the current public debate. And that really um, was reflected in the way that the debate was cast. Again, like it, as I said, it was seen as an importation in France, whereas in France has lots of cases of police violence. And I have this book, which is called Sans portrait contre l'état policier, which is a hundred mm. portraits of of cases of police brutality uh, in France. And the most well-known case is obviously that of Adama Traoré, is who's a young black man uh, who was killed in, in the summer of 2016, allegedly murdered by several police officers who used the same technique um, that was used with George Floyd. And so that's an ongoing case. There were demonstrations also in France, but there was also this debate as to whether the French police is racist. Is it racism from certain individuals or is it actually structural racism? So it, it joins this mm. idea of denialism around structural racism, which takes place in the denialism of that past. So in the end, in France, apart from the overseas depart département, uh, the former overseas colonies which were integrated into France where several of these statues, statues did come down, particularly statues of Victor Solskjaer, who was seen as the abolitionist, but also entrenched the power of white French people within those colonies. Those statues came down, but statues of Colbert did not come down in, in metropolitan. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, people who protest will not give up. We had similar discussions about uh, the Swedish police and, and they're ongoing, they're just mm. taking pauses. But what was very shocking, I think, both for the Swedish example and different countries in Europe, was the eruption of sudden cases of similar violence mm. against black people. It just sort of, not mushroom, but popped up literally everywhere. In Canada, just a few days, I think, after the murder of George Floyd, a black Canadian woman uh, was thrown off a balcony, at least that's what's suspected. And as uh, protests took off and, and started growing, we could also see cases in Sweden and Finland, and I think even more places, where police would resort to the kind of violence that had, had already been shown. So it's, it was like seeing the worst possible nightmare get repeated again and again. For example, in Finland, a young black man was arrested supposedly for not paying his ticket in public transport, mm. but he had. And they, just like George Floyd, they threw him to the ground and sat on him, put their knee on his neck uh, for minutes. And even though this was filmed and critiqued by people please stop doing this. They continued. So there was a hellish energy with which white supremacy in several places just continued mm -hmm. to roll on. That was so terribly frightening that I don't even know what to say. And the same discussion that you showed here in uh, with the hundred cases of witnesses or experience of police brutalities, these types of stories also came up in Sweden, not, not mm -hmm. in printed form, but in uh, separate articles and also articles by people working within law, critiquing the system. But we see the exact same brutality that is state sanction, which is waged upon black people everywhere, and yet it is fiercely denied, most of it. And to some extent, mainstream media have decided to instead give even more space to the police to express their views. So Ilva, we've, we, you know, we've covered the problem of Europe, the problem of Europe articulating race, the problem of Europe articulating its, its racism, the problem of Europe articulating its colonial past in the now. Um, I wanted to shift gears back to the film industry and also yeah. shift gears towards, towards looking at the solutions and towards um, diversity inclusion policies now. We spoke earlier about this idea of the future perfect of inclusion strategies, the fact that they will, when, you know, quite often when we talk to these institutions, it is always something that will happen. It is change which necessitates time. It will happen tomorrow, the day after, and so forth, right? This, this idea of this constantly 
um, self-realizing prophecy. And I think one of the boundaries or one of the, the resistances which you've mentioned is this idea of the necessity argument. Walk us through that. One of the things that many of us run up against is the necessity argument. And the necessity argument comes when uh, diversity work is uh, going to be realized and we discuss the phases or the directions and the focus of what we are going to do together. And very quickly, and, and then I mean almost instantly, black people run up against what appears as necessary to do and the priorities that white leaders of these initiatives or corporations and projects think should be done. We necessarily have to go about it this way. We necessarily have to not listen to your priorities, but this is already decided. And that also comes as a consequence of inviting black people very late into projects when things are already set, the framework is already set, cooperative partners are already set, the initial questions are already set. So when you come into that, the, the space that you are awarded is very conditioned and very small. And so through age, personally, I've become more and more reluctant to enter into these types of, of cooperation. So I will most typically give them a battery of questions. Have you thought about this? Are you thinking about doing this? What kind of future do you see for this initiative? What is it going to land in? What are the results? Who are the black people working with this? How much power or what kind of power are you planning to share with black people themselves? Is it going to be only me or only us for people who get minimal things to do or huge things to, be, to do with too little time and too little pay or no pay. Because these are the circumstances that, that I keep on seeing. When you're met by the necessity argument, that is also a point where you can no longer discuss. I mean, racism is constantly thrown up for, for debate and becomes a question that is up for grabs. But when we're going to work with these issues like diversity and which, what is called inclusion and anti-racist work, there are always necessities that are already in place when I enter. And as said, when, when we reach that point when white people tell me that it's necessary to do this way, we can no longer discuss, we can no longer negotiate, they can no longer hear that I might be more knowledgeable in this discussion than they are because they have just started. They are enthusiastic. They want good things to happen, of course, and they don't see the difficulties I've seen. They don't see and don't have the experience that I and other black people already have. We have seen dozens or maybe hundreds of failures of diversity works already but maybe this person hasn't. It's their first time mm. or their first year or their first uh, position as a decision maker within a system that works with diversity. So there are so very different energies also that go into these types of situations. Exactly. And I'm going to call up on my screen. I'll read this out mm -hmm. um, because it, what you were saying, it, really well it echoes first of all the question of sustainability but also the question of critical whiteness and i'll come back to those two points mm -hmm. the arts in color pledge as i mentioned earlier is a pledge which was penned by anonymous collective of people within the industry i wanted to go for one of its points here everything you said just now echoed that the first point of the pledge i don't know if you mm -hmm. can in here but the, the, this, this point yeah, realize that you don't even know you don't know others lived experiences outside your lived experience and due to the negligence of our industry largely outside mediated experiences you cannot do inclusion work especially as a white person unless you start from a place of ignorance if you do this work assuming you are especially smart and uniquely qualified intellectually or morally to do diversity work automatic disqualification 
if you start with the attitude that you have so much to learn that you can begin with the understanding that you will always be learning, that's the, you know, the positive, the upside, but the daily learning is a key action that makes these other actions possible. This is exactly what you've just said. It has to start on the part of predominantly white institutions and the white people working in, the, in those institutions with this idea that you know, these ideas or these experiences may be new to them, but they're not new to you know, people like yourselves who have been doing research for years. And also uh, what is uh, made a necessity is not only the argument, but the necessity of white people being in positions of leadership. Mm. I don't think that they realize how much time we have to waste waiting for them to catch up. And of course, they won't catch up completely, but to catch up a little bit. We have to wait for them until they realize certain things and often they don't mm. do at all and it, it just becomes a long long discussion where they don't get it but if we had sort of large groups of black people and people of color that could just normally work within for example the film industry i can't even imagine how much easier that would be and, and that was my question beyond the effectiveness of critical whiteness as a tool um, to deconstruct some of the attitudes which you've talked about, how would you conceive measures which could be sustainable to, which could make this change sustainable? Because obviously the change that you've described when it's, you know, brought into place with this necessity argument isn't sustainable, it will fail. And you've mentioned many examples of diversity and inclusion policies which have failed, but um, how could that be made to be sustainable? Well, I'm principally against sort of helping the group that is subjected to racist violence should not be given the responsibility to, to solve the situation. So I will not do that, but say only that it's very simple. Let black and brown people in. It's simple. We don't need special pedagogies. We don't need special initiatives that are created, especially for us, need to be treated as people. We are grown-ups. We have competences just as everybody else. And something that I've encountered also during the, for the longest time is something I could call deprofessionalization, meaning that when racism gets into the picture of a discussion, it is also obstructing what we, what we usually know about our occupations and other people's occupations or i should change this into what white people know about occupations occupational skills and so on one of the recurrent observations in my work with the interview material of the report for the swedish film institute <clears throat> was that actresses and directors get deprofessionalized in their everyday working context. They would be subjected to insults, being dominated, passed over, reduced to being ignorant or imaged as being inexperienced. And in these contexts, their white co-workers also, in a sense, you could say, appear to deprofessionalize themselves. Mm. They demand sexist or racist things that they would never expect from a white man, for example, or they simply disregard do working process in ways that bring the entire set to a halt. So what could be the everyday humdrum of work, of film production, or preparatory work that gets obstructed by racist events. I won't give you all the concrete examples, but everything is brought to a standstill because white people simply cannot get over the fact that black women or women of color or women for that matter can have experience, can in the role of a director, for instance, ask a, a white man, can you do this? A director, for example, has a given position of power. They lead the work at the film set or the TV set. But I saw so many instances of both men and also other white women that were trying to subvert or go against 
that given power. Mm. And some of the women directors said that only when I raised my voice, I could get actors and uh, photographers, for instance, to do what they were supposed to do. And many of them exemplified also that when a male director asks someone to do something, they do it. When a woman director, and particularly a director of color or a black director, asked it, then there would be a discussion or there would be a resistance or trivialization of the situation. So that is one example or a few examples of, of deprofessionalization. And so um, in connection with what you've just described, the lack of professionality, um, you've really highlighted the experiences of um, sexual harassment and misconduct that have affected uh, black women and other women of color within the Swedish context. And this contrasts very much with the perception that we on the outside have of Sweden as being the beacon of the 50-50 uh, movement um, as embodying that movement, of the Swedish film industry embodying that movement and of the institute embodying that movement. What I wanted to know from you is how did these experiences of these black women and other women of colour come to the fore during the, the Me Too movement in Sweden? I assume that there was a Me Too movement also in Sweden. Yes, there was a, a Me Too movement, but it fairly quickly got into trouble since mm -hmm. uh, white women uh, as usually, because, because that is something that keeps getting repeated. Uh, white people take initiatives and uh, rush ahead and forget that we're not all white. And then they have to sort of retract re their steps and reconsider. But that stage and or phase is very difficult in Sweden because since so many of the, the white majority are convinced that racism is just not a structural problem but mm -hmm. an occasional accident then they're never suspicious and feel the need to think be before they rush forward so they rush forward with lots and lots of initiatives and then afterwards they need to think or are made to think by black and brown agents within the same sector that mm -hmm. well you need to rethink this because this experience is not shared by everybody in fact, the oppression that you speak of for white women is so much worse for black women and other women of color. And it might look different from the kind of sexes and oppression that you as a white woman experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the problem of the Me Too movement as well, that very quickly there was also protests from women of color all over the place. and. Um, that is also recurrently when that second wave comes of critique because it's only let in after a while when it cannot be silenced anymore. So it always appears as if it's coming after mm. in the wake of the protest when in fact it is there all the time. So at this point I wouldn't know what the Me Too movement has landed but I do know that the negotiations that they had around these issues about the omissions mm -hmm. uh, of racism has been difficult territory mm -hmm. to say the least. I, I won't go into detail but, but it has been difficult because the denial in Sweden is so and the structures work with this denial so much since we cannot even often gain ground in normalizing an acceptance that racism is real. I mean, Black Lives Matter this spring and summer has helped, certainly, but it is still a moment and we have yet to see what will be next. Indeed, let's see where this uh, all goes. I think the prospect of the gaze into the future to see where all the dust lands is a great point to end on. We are at time. Ilva, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I really look forward to the continuing this conversation in other contexts. Let's see where all of this that we've discussed uh, goes and uh, let's stay in touch. Yes, please. That would be wonderful. Very happy to talk with you.